All right, thanks very much. Um, it's, uh, it's great, uh, I think it's great for all of us uh, who are speaking to be part of this sort of a session because it's something we don't get to do very often. Um, so most of the time when we're speaking, it's to physicians and, um, and uh, in academic settings and uh, so we don't get to um, talk and interact with uh, patients and people who are actually um, truly on the front line of all of these things. So. I'm grateful to be here and, uh, and grateful for all of Omid's work and setting this up year after year and doing such a great job. Um, I'll steal a line from a colleague of ours in New York, uh, Dan Coit, uh, just to let you know that uh, my job this morning is to talk, your job this morning is to listen, and I trust that you will let me know if you finish up before I do. So surgery uh, in melanoma, you've, melanoma's in the news uh, a lot uh, with various breakthroughs and Nobel Prizes and Dancing with the Stars and, um, and much of what you hear about in melanoma has to do with the drugs that are used, uh, the new blockbuster uh, drugs. Uh, but in fact, uh, for most patients with melanoma, surgery is the treatment that they get and it's all the treatment that they need. Um, most patients who present with melanoma present with localized melanoma that can just be removed uh, surgically, and most of the time when that happens, they're cured at that time. Uh, so surgery is a central part of, um, of treatment of melanoma, even if it isn't part of the um, New York Times uh, front page very often. Um, and surgery fits into melanoma in three areas, treatment of the original spot on the skin, uh, treatment of the lymph nodes, which are generally the first place that melanoma will move to if it's going to move, um, and uh, treatment of distant metastatic sites in some instances as well that we'll talk about. Um, so the primary site's the most common thing that needs treatment, and our original plan for treating that dates back over 100 years uh, to Samson Handley, who was a surgeon in um, England. Uh, who proposed really the first uh, uh, guidelines for treatment of primary melanoma. And based on essentially a single case, uh, he suggested that uh, the risk of these small uh, metastases adjacent to the original melanoma site warranted then a fairly thorough treatment of that area surgically. And so what he said was to measure an inch away from the, um, the primary tumor site, on the surface, and that's actually not that different from a two centimeter margin that we might use in some instances today, but then under the skin, take out a whole bunch of more tissue, probably out to about a five centimeter width, uh, including the fascia and part of the muscle underneath and such. Um, and so it's fairly extensive treatment. And really the treatment remained, the surgical treatment of the primary site remained very extensive like that uh, for a century and more. Uh, so up through the 1970s, recommendations varied anywhere from two centimeters to five centimeters, eight centimeters, 15 centimeters, as wide as possible. Um, uh, so you can imagine that uh, if you have a little melanoma and you're taking out an area of skin that's that big, there are significant uh, issues with recovery afterward potentially. And so um, one wondered whether you needed to do that. And it's through a whole series of clinical trials much like the trials that some of you have experienced for treatment of, uh, with medication, clinical trials evaluating different surgical treatments. And so the French and the Swedes uh, did trials where they compared that in a sort of standard margin of five centimeters to two centimeters, and they found that there was no difference in the rates of uh, disease-free survival uh, based on that difference. Um, so these are survival curves, which you'll probably see about a 1,000 of today. Um, but they just show you how many, starting from 100%, what percent of the people are either alive or, in this case, free of recurrence of their melanoma over time. Um, and so there are two lines in each of these things that are overlapping, showing that there's no difference between uh, the two types of treatments. Uh, and then the Italians did a trial comparing one centimeter and three centimeters. This is for relatively low-risk thin melanomas and, again, showed no difference um, in recurrences. And so these narrower margins got accepted. Uh, for thicker, higher-risk melanomas, there were, have been comparisons uh, between one and three centimeters, which actually showed an advantage to the wider margin, um, and then subsequently between two and four centimeters and showed that they were the same in terms of outcome. Uh, and so um, from these great big excisions that were standardly done requiring skin grafts and complex, complex flaps and such, we're now down to much smaller margins that appear to be quite safe. 
What about lymph nodes? Uh, so lymph nodes are very important uh, for melanoma, as we'll see. Um, but what are lymph nodes? They're little immune organs, more or less. Um, and the fluid that's in the tissues of the body gets absorbed through these open-ended lymphatic channels and passes uh, easily then up into lymph nodes. And they look for signs of infection and form material and things like that. But it's also the pathway that tumor cells can take. It's the easiest pathway for them to take. So if they're going to be anywhere, they're most likely to be uh, in these lymph nodes at the end of these channels. And um, the importance of lymph nodes, the recognition of the importance of lymph nodes goes way back. Uh, so again, this goes back to the 18th century uh, where John Hunter with the first uh, case of uh, melanoma that's been reported. This is the specimen that he had. Um, and it's actually a lymph node, not a melanoma on the skin, and still uh, open for viewing at the Hunterian Museum over in England. Um, uh, but the idea is that, uh, that tumor cells from, if this is a schematic, maybe a pointer here. Um, so if um, this is a primary melanoma skin, these are the lymphatic channels and lymph nodes that they might drain to, and then the bloodstream and getting to the rest of the body, the tumor cells can spread most easily here. They could potentially then grow in that lymph node and spread to other sites. Um, and uh, so the question is, what do you do about that? And so another English surgeon, uh, Herbert Snow, also at about the same time, the turn of the 20th century, proposed um, what he called anticipatory gland excision. Uh, so that's his uh, publication from the Lancet um, Medical Journal. And uh, he said that even before you have any signs of melanoma showing up in any lymph nodes, you need to take those lymph nodes out. So you take out the skin thing and you take out the lymph nodes all at the same time. Uh, because if you wait until uh, things show up as a lump in the lymph node, it's too late. Um, and so you have to get in there right away and do it right away and that will uh, prevent subsequent spread. And that set off a, then a debate that lasted for over a century as to whether that added surgery was necessary or not. Um, and then th there were additional clinical trials that were done uh, that asked that question where some people got the lymph nodes taken out and some people didn't. Um, and they mostly turned out like this where there was the group that got the lymph nodes taken out had a better survival than the group that didn't, but not by a significant, a statistically significant amount. And this was reproduced in a few different trials. And so if you believed in the lymph node dissection, you still believed in the lymph node dissection. If you didn't believe in the lymph node dissection, then you still didn't believe in the lymph node dissection. Um, but the, the, uh, the issue was that um, if there was a benefit, it was only to some of the patients that uh, were being treated with this operation. Um, and so if you had 100 people, most of them didn't have anything wrong with their lymph nodes. And so they had all their lymph nodes taken out only to discover that they were all fine to begin with. Um, there were other people that already had disease that had spread beyond the lymph nodes. So treating their lymph nodes wouldn't have, uh, have prevented that from happening. And it's only a select group that might have benefit, but you've subjected everyone to the operation. Um, and so that situation has changed based on development of a sentinel lymph node biopsy, which I'm sure some of you have had. Um, and that's a procedure where you can figure out where the specific location of the drainage is for any given melanoma. And it started actually through uh, Don Morton's work, and he was a believer in elective lymph node dissection, taking out all the lymph nodes. But in some cases, you couldn't tell which lymph nodes you were supposed to take out. And so this is an early lymphocyntogram, a, a radiology test, where they injected, in this case, uh, colloidal gold, uh, little gold particles, at the primary melanoma site here. And they saw that it drained to these lymph node basins. And so they knew those were the, those were the ones that they were supposed to take out. Um, but it was still just a way of uh, selecting an entire lymph node basin to remove, rather than an individual lymph node. But as technology improved, they began to see on these lymphocytograms that it wasn't an entire basin that lit up, but just an individual lymph node or two. And so the thought, Dr. Morton's thought was, can we just take out those individual lymph nodes and, and then see if those are okay, we'd leave the other ones alone. And in fact, it works quite well. So again, a schematic, a melanoma on the skin and lymphatic channels to lymph nodes. And the, the tumor cells can follow those channels but you can follow those channels as well by injecting tracers or a blue dye at the skin site and then following those channels to the lymph node that turns blue. And that's the sentinel lymph node. And if that lymph node's okay, the other lymph node should be okay as well and you can leave them alone. And this is what it looks like in real life. This is on the skin and you can actually see these little lymphatic channels filling with the blue dye. Uh, 
they then uh, collate into larger channels that eventually end up uh, in a lymph node basin. You can follow those channels down uh, to an individual lymph node. And you can see that you can leave the other lymphatic channels, little nerves and blood vessels, you can leave those alone and just take out the thing that you're after. And so the morbidity of this intervention is dramatically less than it was to take out all of the lymph nodes. And so then this got put to the test of clinical trials as well. And so this is the first multi, multi center selective lymphadenectomy, MSLT, trial uh, that compared patients who were treated with just a wide excision of their melanoma to patients that had a wide excision and a sentinel node biopsy. And if they had a recurrence in the observation arm, they'd have a dissection then. And if they had a positive sentinel node, a sentinel node with a metastasis, then they'd have a dissection at that time. And um, the question was, what, is there a difference in survival? And um, in many ways, this was a similar trial to the elective lymph node dissection trials and that there wasn't a significant difference uh, between the two arms. Again, the group that had the lymph nodes taken out did a little bit better, but not by a statistically significant amount. Um, but when you look at the patients that actually had disease in their lymph nodes, uh, the ones that had a recurrence later on in their lymph node or that had a lymph node metastasis on the sentinel node, that group, there was a big difference in outcome. So from a sort of biological point of view, it looks like there probably is an advantage if you have a metastasis in your lymph node to getting it out early. Um, it's hard to know um, statistically because those groups aren't pure from a, a statistician's point of view, whether that's a real relationship or whether there's some unknown bias that caused that difference in the outcomes. Our group of statisticians that worked on the trial tried to adjust for that and they came up with this fairly intuitive way of um, adjusting for uh, potential biases. I'm sure you're, you're wondering, yeah, should this really be to the M or should it be to, you know, but cut them some slack. Uh, in any event, they thought, so they, their conclusion was that there does appear to be a benefit if you have a lymph node metastasis for intermediate thickness melanoma anyway of getting it out early. But it's a little bit of an academic, um, uh, somewhat moot point uh, because there are other values to sentinel node biopsy uh, beyond uh, the, a survival advantage. Uh, and one of the most important ones is figuring out what the stage of the melanoma is, what the risk of a recurrence is, and what the appropriate treatment is. And just as an example of uh, sort of the difference this has made in our understanding, our ability to express to patients what their outlook is, we can compare two different staging systems. So the staging system is a way of, for us to just put people into groups, into risk groups more or less. Um, and so uh, there's stage one as low risk localized, stage two is higher risk localized melanomas, three is when it's moved to lymph nodes, and four is when it's moved to other sites in the body. And so um, the AJCC is the group that comes up with these staging systems. And uh, they've just come out not that long ago with the eighth edition. Um, and the, in melanoma, one of the big differences between the eighth edition and the seventh edition, one before that, was fully incorporating sentinel node biopsy into this ability to predict how people are gonna do. And so if you look back at the um, seventh edition uh, for stage one and two melanoma, this is people that they thought had localized melanoma just without any lymph node involvement. Um, these are the outcomes and they're pretty bad actually for a number of the groups where you thought that the melanoma was just confined to the skin. Um, but not everybody who was in the database uh, for this staging system actually had a sentinel lymph node biopsy done. And so there are probably a decent number of people in these groups that were actually stage three, we just didn't know it. So the current edition actually mandated that everybody uh, that needed a sentinel node biopsy had one done. And if you look at the same stages in the eighth edition, they do a whole lot better. Um, and so you really now, with that information, can give people a much better estimate about what the future holds and then what the appropriate response is and what the treatment should be. So you, sentinel node will be part of what happens, uh, whether or not you think there's a survival benefit to it or not. Um, but then we were left with the question of what to do with people that have a positive sentinel lymph node because the standard that, at that time was still for everyone then to have a full lymph node dissection done and take out the rest of the lymph nodes. Um, and the question is, is that really necessary? Uh, so you've taken out the sentinel node and the skin tumor. Do you need to take out the rest of those lymph nodes? And it's a reasonable question because most of the time, the rest of those lymph nodes are fine. Um, and so 80 to 90% of the time, 
you've gone through this operation and all those nodes are normal. Um, and um, you do get some advantage out of that, so 10 or 20 percent of the time we've taken out more melanoma. Um, you get complete staging information, so the other nodes have additional value in predicting how people will do over time. Um, it was required for clinical trials in the past, um, and also you're less likely to recur in your lymph nodes if you've had your lymph nodes taken out. But it comes at a cost. Uh, most of the completion lymph node dissections are clear, and there are complications, nerve injury, lymphedema that can come with these bigger operations. Um, and if there is disease in those other lymph nodes, it may already be beyond the lymph nodes at that point anyway, uh, so there may not be a, a, an advantage. And so a new clinical trial was then designed, the second MSLT trial, uh, that asked the question, what do you get uh, in exchange for this completion lymph node dissection? Um, and essentially the, the important part of this is that people with melanomas on the skin who had a positive sentinel lymph node, a melanoma in their sentinel lymph node, were then assigned either to have a, an immediate complete lymph node dissection done uh, or to have um, follow-up observation of their lymph nodes with ultrasounds as a way of trying to detect the melanoma at an early time point and only having surgery at that point if they needed it. And so that trial now has been completed and we reported out those results and they're, uh, they're here and there is no survival advantage to having the bigger surgery done. Um, and so now observation of those lymph nodes is, um, is a standard reasonable option uh, for patients with melanoma in their central lymph node. Um, we also found that uh, by taking out those lymph nodes, you do decrease the risk of recurrence overall by a small amount. So that's the difference between the red and the blue. Um, but all of that difference comes from um, decreasing the risk of recurrence in the lymph nodes. So here, uh, the blue having had the dissection the red knot and recurrence in the lymph nodes, much greater if you haven't had the lymph nodes taken out, obviously. But in terms of the risk of the melanoma coming back at sites beyond the lymph nodes, there was absolutely no difference between the groups. The other interesting thing that we saw with the trial was that um, the rate of people having involvement of not central lymph nodes, um, I'd say either the people that were observed that then had recurrence in their nodes or the people had the surgery and they found melanoma in those other lymph nodes, didn't turn out to be the same in the trial and the two arms of the trial, uh, which doesn't make any sense. It's a random assignment, so it should work out that both groups had the same thing. Uh, and that's probably just because uh, there are people that had metastases in their lymph nodes taken out during the dissection that just weren't seen by the pathologist. It's the most likely explanation. Um, in any event, the other thing that that uh, interesting curve, that uh, thing that that curve uh, shows is that there's actually very good control of melanoma in lymph nodes from just taking out the central lymph node. So this is the group, this is recurrence in the lymph node basin in the group that had a, a completion lymph node dissection. So uh, if you have a completion dissection and you had disease there, about 12% of the people had other nodes involved, and then there are a few that had additional recurrences beyond uh, that time. In the group that didn't have any of their other lymph nodes taken out, Yes, more of them have uh, up to 25 or so percent of people have recurrence in other lymph nodes over time, but fully three quarters of the people uh, that had melanoma metastases in their lymph nodes that didn't have any other lymph nodes taken out never had a recurrence in their lymph node basin. So all of the disease was taken out just with the central node biopsy without having to go through the big operation. So it's actually the, the smaller minimally invasive procedure is actually a reasonable uh, regional disease control intervention as well. So um, based on the trials that were done, it's now a reasonable option not to have the rest of the lymph nodes taken out. You do lose some things, so you get additional staging information from those, those other lymph nodes, and that may be helpful for some people in deciding what other treatment they want to have. And there's a higher risk of recurrence in the lymph nodes, but that can usually be addressed if it needs to later on. Um, and uh, the question we now face is, are there other ways of getting that same information that we used to get from those lymph nodes through other means? And we're looking at how much melanoma was in the sentinel lymph node. We're looking at um, things like uh, gene expression profiling, those sorts of things to help try to distinguish who's likely to recur from the people that aren't and replace that information. So um, other things we found from these trials, one is that ultrasound, although it's probably a useful tool in this follow-up setting, is a lousy replacement for a sentinel lymph node biopsy. 
uh, it's just not sensitive enough to find the tiny little metastases that we can find with the central node biopsy. Smoking, uh, we looked at uh, smoking status, people that are current smokers, former smokers, and never smokers in the trial. Turns out, smoking is bad for you. <laughs> um, so if you're a current smoker, your risk of having a metastasis in your lymph node is higher. Don't know why that would be the case. There are various reasons why it might be, but um, uh, it does increase that risk. Um, the timing, people are often worried about getting in to have their surgery immediately, uh, the day after their biopsy. Um, it looks like you actually have some flexibility there. We looked at the interval in between when the biopsy is done and when the definitive surgery is done. And if you wait uh, more than 30 days, if you wait more than 40 days, it doesn't seem to have any impact on your risk of recurrence or your risk of dying of melanoma. So mostly we want to rush ahead to get the information and move on, um, but um, it's actually probably safe to wait a little bit anyway. Um, other things that we've done have been to try to develop ways of making this, the larger surgery um, safer and uh, have a lower risk of complications. And um, the highest risk surgery in terms of the lymph nodes is probably the groin dissection. So things like swelling of the leg can happen, nerve issues, and, and those acute complications, uh, wound breakdown and things like that. And that happens because where the lymph nodes live, they're at the top of the leg, um, yeah, there are big blood vessels that run through and a nerve that runs through there as well. And if you think about the blood supply to the skin, this is looking on a cross section, here are these blood vessels. The blood supply uh, comes right up directly to the skin, but that's where the lymph nodes live. So if you take out the lymph nodes, you take out much of that blood supply, and then if you make a big incision in the skin, you break this uh, plexus of blood vessels along the undersurface, and that leads to wound healing issues. So rather than making that big incision, now we do this surgery with uh, the same sort of equipment that we use to take gallbladders out and appendixes out and things like that with just tiny little incisions lower down on the leg. And at least the acute complication rates seem to be much less uh, with that approach. Um, so finally, what about distant sites of, uh, of melanoma and what, what role does surgery play in that? Um, because if, if you think of that as it's spread, melanoma that's spread through the bloodstream, um, it's uh, often people think that's too late to do anything with surgery for those types of patients. Um, but in fact, it probably plays some role. And the, one of the questions that we face is what is that role exactly? And how has that role changed now that the medications that are available are so much better than they used to be? So uh, surgery's gotten better because we're better able to detect uh, small metastases. And just uh, don't bother looking at what's the, the things that are on the scan, but just to look at the resolution of CT scans. This is literally from a textbook from 1990, and then 2003, and then 2008, and just the level of detail that you can see on these modern scans is much better than what we could see uh, in the past. So our ability to know where the disease is is better than it used to be. We have tools beyond just simple surgery to deal with uh, metastases as well. Um, you know, with uh, advanced radiation type techniques that are radio surgery, more or less, to be able to focus high doses of radiation and, and kill small tumors in various parts of the body without surgery. So there are ways of getting at individual tumors. When we look historically at the role of surgery in metastatic melanoma, um, actually if people were candidates to have surgical resection of metastatic disease, uh, in some instances, they did pretty well, even the absence of effective medications. So this is a trial that was done of a vaccine, uh, and there's no difference between the group that got a vaccine and the group that got a placebo here. Uh, but the interesting thing in this trial is that the survival at uh, five years and beyond uh, was 40% in a, a stage four melanoma in era before uh, effective medicines. So uh, that world has changed, though. Uh, so you'll hear more about this today, but back then we had DTIC, uh, chemotherapy. Uh, we had interferon and interleukin-2. That was sort of it for a very long period of time. And this is the world we're in now, right? So um, it's, it's a totally uh, changed world. Um, but surgery probably still plays a role. Um, so in thinking about where it might be used, in liver resection for metastatic melanoma, it's not common that the patients with liver metastases are candidates, but if they are, they tend to do better than if they're not. But an interesting thing that we've seen in these data more recently is that people that have had some degree of success with medical therapy prior to the surgery actually do a bunch better than the people that um, either didn't uh, have benefit from medical therapy or uh, who hadn't had any medical therapy before the surgery. 
So there may be a role of surgery in consolidating um, a response to uh, an, uh, an otherwise effective uh, medical treatment. Another example of that is in patients that had adrenalectomy uh, for metastatic melanoma. And again, surgery uh, did relatively okay in patients that were treated surgically. But here, even in patients where there was some disease that was left um, behind, uh, those patients did about as well as people who had everything taken out. And when we looked at who those people were, it was people that had good responses, stable disease, and say a lung lesion, but their adrenal gland metastasis was growing. And we took that metastasis out, and then they continued to do relatively well after that. Um, combinations with the modern uh, immune therapies, we don't know um, what the right sequence is. Do we do surgery first, or do we do medical therapy first? When we've looked at people that have had various sequences, they seem to do about the same. Uh, the indication for the surgery, though, matters. So if it's someone that has an isolated, persistent site of melanoma that gets taken out, they actually have uh, quite high long-term survivals. If they have a lesion that's only been taken out because they're symptomatic, a bowel obstruction, something like that, they do relatively well. But if people have general progression on their medical therapy, it doesn't look, look, look like surgery adds a whole lot, uh, potentially, to, to their treatment. Um, and this is just a, another bigger series of essentially the same thing. And the one thing I'll highlight, though, is this curve, which is actually the comparison of older treated patients to newer treated patients with the modern drugs doing better. Um, so is there a benefit to surgery above medical therapy? There may be. And one of the roles may be getting rid of the bulk of melanoma that's there and allowing the medication to be more effective at the small amount that's remaining. There are some uh, biological uh, data that suggest that may be the case, comparing patients that have uh, this a ratio between the amount of tumor burden that they have and the activation of their immune cells. Um, and from a couple of different data sets, if they have a good ratio with lower tumor burden, uh, their survivals are much better than if they have a bigger tumor burden. Um, if you look at the effectiveness of the targeted therapies, the oral medications, uh, they seem to work better and for longer in patients that have a smaller amount of disease when they're being treated. Um, and then uh, the adjuvant setting, I won't steal Dr. Ganji's thunder because she's going to talk about adjuvant and neoadjuvant treatment. Uh, but if the drugs work better um, in the setting where everything's been taken out uh, surgically, then that suggests this low volume of disease that's left is most vulnerable to the drugs. In any event, so if you're faced with the option of which do you do first, um, it's hard to know what the right answer is. Uh, so you should have surgery first because that may be all that you need. Um, you may improve the effectiveness of the drugs if you do get them. Surgery, uh, by historic standards, used to be considered to be expensive, but in the modern age of, uh, of the, what these drugs cost, it is dirt cheap. Um, <laughs> And you may not get another crack at surgery. In other words, if, if there's a, uh, you may become ineligible for surgery uh, over time. Uh, but there are arguments for doing systemic therapy first. Um, it may, that may be all that's needed in the era where you may potentially cure people. Um, you can select out the people that are not going to do well with surgery who might progress early. Um, and it's a shorter time until you're on the systemic therapy. So. Um, and you can get these, most of these drugs and it doesn't affect your ability to have surgery later on. Um, so questions still to be answered probably through more clinical trials. In any event, just to bring it all back together again, I think overall surgery, its role in melanoma, it has be, um, been and will remain a mainstay for most melanoma patients. Um, it's more accurate, the surgery is more accurate than it used to be, it's less invasive than it used to be. Um, and this role in this metastatic disease is evolving. So we'll probably be talking about that at this seminar for years to come. In any event, I wanted to thank, recognize all the people that contributed to all of these trials and all of the work that you've seen. It's a huge number of people that are required to do all these things. Um, and then particularly to recognize the patients who are willing uh, to essentially go into the unknown and uh, be clinical trial subjects that have made the progress that we've, uh, we've seen possible. So thanks very much.